Hey guys, today I'm out for a Cantharella Cinnabarinus, and that's the Cinnabar Chanterelle. Uh, these little guys are spectacularly gorgeous. I can't really capture it on these cameras, um, but the color is just fluorescent coral pink. Um, they're incredibly delicious. They're very, they're smaller than regular chanterelles, like golden chanterelles, uh, but they are just equally as meaty. Uh, you've got to collect quite a few more of them to, to make a meal, but they are exquisitely delicious. More often than not, you'll find uh, Cantharellus cinnabarinus uh, growing with oak or uh, beech, and occasionally maple as well, but um, oak I find them on probably most commonly, and then pine, red pine, they really like pine as well, and probably a couple other varieties of pine as well, but I always find them with red pine. Very tight. So yeah, you want to look, keep your eye out for these big massive oak trees. Uh, like I said, large beech as well, maple, they really like hardwoods, and uh, pine is sort of the exception to that, they really like pine as well. And uh, they grow gregariously, so you'll always find them kind of growing in groups. Very seldom you'll find like just one. You know, this tree here probably has about 15 on it at least. So nice. Oh, baby. So with the uh, Cantharella cinnabarinus, um, you're going to find them growing in open, exposed areas, um, often in small shrubbery. You can see this line that's following here. They always follow a root, so you can see uh, they'll typically grow in, in sort of a line pattern. Um, sometimes you'll just find little clusters of them. And uh, these are actually growing with a mix. So there's one here that's growing with oak, and there's a group of them growing with maple here as well. You see some miscellaneous ones there. There's one lost one there. These guys here just started forming last week. I came out and uh, I was a little bit early, which is always where you kind of want to be. <clears throat> and uh, so they were just a little primordial last week. And then we got a little bit of rain this week. We didn't get much, so I'm expecting a lot more this week. Um, but basically, uh, once these guys, so the chanterelles, the golden chanterelles, once they've come out, uh, that notifies me that these guys will be out in the next week. If you look closely, you can see the decurrent gills, uh, false gills. Um, the difference between these and true gills, as you can see, these are just little folds. They're very, very delicate, very tender, and uh, they go all the way from the cap down the stem, down to the about the center point. And that's a telltale sail that you're, or a telltale sign that you're looking at a, a Cantharella species. So after these guys come out, about a week or two later, we'll start getting uh, Horn of Horn of Plenty and uh, Maitake. Uh, and then we start slipping into the early fall mushrooms, the late summer, uh, early fall mushrooms. When you do find some, you want to keep walking around in the area. You'll definitely come across more. Those are some beautiful ones there. Absolutely gorgeous. And so these ones up here are growing with oak. And like I said, uh, you'll, you'll often find them growing, you know, 10, 15, even 20 feet sometimes away from the tree. It's wherever the root goes. Where are they? Oh, here we go. So these ones are growing with maple. Maple. This one's growing with a beech tree right here. I'm going to assume it's the beech tree because everything else is quite far away and the beech is right close to it. And then we've got these little oak lovers up here. So once you see a couple of these out guys, you want to head out and start picking because they don't last too long. They're only out for about two weeks and, uh, and then they're gone. These are the color uh, you want to harvest them at. These are just beautiful. I can pick this up on the camera. Such a deep color. Beautiful.
it just rained, so uh, they're just starting to come up now. But uh, I take these little butts back so that I can take some of the living tissue off it and clone it onto agar. Those are so nice. So when it comes to harvesting uh, Cantharella cinnabarinus, uh, the cinnabar chanterelle, you basically want to... It's very simple, I shouldn't even have to show you guys this, but I'll do it anyways, just for your intention. You basically want to grab around the base of the mushroom and just gently pull up. These mushrooms don't really tear over a huge root base, so they're very, very easy to harvest. Just a simple pluck. I highly recommend uh, you leave anything smaller than these little guys here. These are really meaty, that's the reason I'm going to take them, but uh, anything smaller than that, you should just leave it to grow out and, and come back and check your area in a couple more days. But you can see that. You don't need to cut chanterelles, and I highly recommend you don't. Um, you're probably going to do more damage by cutting it with a dirty knife that you've just transferred, you know, mold and bacteria from one end of the forest to the other on. Uh, a lot of people don't think of that kind of stuff, but, um, you know, before they make these huge claims that, you know, you've got to cut your mushrooms. No, you you got to take it delicately uh, and not disturb the soil around them, but you can harvest mushrooms very effectively by just grabbing around the base and gently plucking and twisting at the same time. And as a mushroom cultivator, I've grown over 100 species of mushrooms. I can tell you that about 99% of them uh, should be harvested that way. So, nature is sort of the same way. Uh, in my opinion, the mycelium that's under the ground is more important. Uh, that's what produces these mushrooms, and the mushrooms are expendable. So they basically create these mushrooms. In my opinion, they make them tasty on purpose for, in terms of mushrooms that are edible and, and do taste good, have a culinary appeal. They do that on purpose so that other organisms will come in search of these and, and in search of the smells and the, the flavors and the nutrients. And in, in doing so, uh, these expendable mushrooms then drop spores and, and are able to reproduce, which is why they're, they were created in the first place. The mycelium uses these as its way to drop spores and spread through. I mean, spores can circumnavigate the globe on, on the slightest air current. So they could drop these spores from the mushrooms in my hand right now and they could fly all the way over to Japan. Like, there's no terrestrial land in the world that's safe from, uh, from uh, colonization of, of mushroom species. So as long as the, the, the substrate or the nutrients that they need are available and the spores land on it and there's humidity, you're going to get mushrooms. So because I don't have uh, Cantharella cinnabarinus on, uh, on agar plates yet, uh, I'm going to be taking, if you look down here, that white fuzzy mycelium around the base of those little primordia. I'm going to be taking that back to the lab and uh, we'll be able to cultivate this one. I have a couple good mycorrhizal uh, recipes uh, for agar, and I've successfully gotten uh, the white morel, black morel, gold morel, and burn morel to grow, as well as uh, golden chanterelles, uh, blue chanterelles, um, Russell Abri vipes, um, king bolet, uh, boletus edulis, uh, matsutake, white matsutake from the west coast, which is Tricholoma magnivillare, and uh, several others, but basically uh, my company is trying to um, collect as many of these mycorrhizal, uh, mycorrhizal species as we can and uh, get them onto culture so that people can start growing or trying to solve the, the riddle of growing mycorrhizal mushrooms. Now, so mycorrhizal mushrooms are mushroom species that, uh, whose, whose mycelium forms a symbiotic relationship with, with a host tree. So an ectomycorrhizal host would be, um, like say chanterelles, these, uh, these cinnabar chanterelles for example, they'll form a symbiotic relationship with oak uh, and maple and beech. And in doing so, uh, basically what happens is the roots of these cinnabar chanterelles can extend a lot further than the, the roots of the tree. And uh, in exchange for sugars from the tree, which the mycelium uh, uses to form these little mushrooms uh, and drop its spores, in exchange uh, the tree gets uh, water because uh, mushrooms as they grow through the soil or whatever substrate they're growing through, they actually push water through it and they give water off as a byproduct almost. And so what happens is they give the tree the extra water and they also uh, give the tree their excess nitrogen. So basically the tree gets its nutrients and water uh, from, from these mycorrhizal mushrooms. And, uh, and basically any healthy forest uh, has to have these species present. Um, you, you'll never find a forest uh, that has a healthy biodiversity or, or a healthy um, sort of environment or a smaller, or smaller ecosystem. Uh, it won't happen. You need to have these mycorrhizal mushrooms. They decay and they create a food source for numerous insects, uh, which, you know, uh, being on the, the lower end of the trophic level, 
kind of channels up and feeds the uh, the higher trophic predators uh, and getting up into the mammals and uh, and so on and so forth. So not only being a, a food supply for us, they're also an incredible uh, sort of balancer in nature, and uh, they feed a lot of different organisms that would honestly go extinct if they didn't have these mushrooms to eat. So <clears throat> right now. With these specimens, uh, my corazon mushrooms aren't like other mushrooms, so uh, they don't grow like my saprobic mushrooms or my copper, uh, copernaceous mushrooms in that they, they don't really break down material, material around them. They sort of take the available nutrients, uh, which are created by the um, other microorganisms, bacteria, other fungi, um, which actually create these in the soil. Uh, they, they make these nutrients readily available to these mushrooms. Now normally you don't want to disturb the mycelium in the forest floor, but uh, in this case we want to take a nice clean sample back of this healthy uh, white mycelium. It's hard to film this and capture at the same time. So you can see here, and we bring these guys back, and these will go on plate tonight. Now the reason why I take a little bit of soil with me around the roots is because um, a lot of the reason people can't get these guys to grow uh, in a contained environment is for one, they're not trying to grow them with an ectomycorrhizal host, which is key. Um, because these mushrooms don't break down, they're not the huge decomposers everybody thinks they are, um, they also can't create their own nutrients. So even growing them on petri dishes, you have to constantly transfer them, otherwise they'll, they'll eat the simple sugars uh, and then they die. That's sort of without that constant f uh, food source, that supply of nutrients from the tree, these mushrooms can't survive either. So they really, they're, it's a fascinating uh, sort of relationship in nature. One of many. You can see here, I got a nice handful. <laughs> oh, these freaking mosquitoes are crazy. You can see here, I've got a nice big handful. Got a nice little handful here. And, uh, you know, once you find a couple of them, you know that they're out in season. So, last week I was a little bit early, and they were just starting to come up, a couple of little young pins. And uh, today we're going to be out finding uh, the next sort of big wave, because we just got some rain two days ago. And uh, hopefully, in another two days, we're supposed to get some more rain. These videos just don't do them justice. They're like the most incredibly beautiful pink, like coral pink colored uh, little guys here. And you'll most often find them growing out of exposed soil. Um, you know, sometimes you'll find them pushing leaves up, but they, they really like the exposed soil. And they also grow out of moss very commonly. So, um, and always when you find these guys, have a quick look around. They do grow gregariously, and uh, so you'll often find, you know, if you find one, you probably find 20 or 30 of them. And they are just stunning, aren't they? <laughs> 